both government and private. At one point, I participated in a meeting in which BIT team members met with representatives of the Department of Energy and Climate Change. It was fitting that this meeting was during that week when everyone was struggling to stay warm, because the topic was how to get more people to insulate their attics, locally known as lofts. In a world of econs, everyone would have already insulated their attic. The savings in energy costs can repay the costs of the insulation in as little as one year. Nevertheless, about a third of the homes in Britain still did not have sufficient insulation in their attics, and the department had launched an initiative to encourage the laggards to stop procrastinating. The initiative offered subsidies to both owners and landlords to better insulate their homes and install other energy-saving products. Not many people were taking the department up on their deal. The Behavioral Insights team promised to think about what might be done. The proposed intervention embraced the make-it-easy mantra. When homeowners were interviewed and asked why they had not added insulation, even though it would save them money, many replied that it was too much trouble because they had so much clutter in their attics. The BIT proposed that the private firms that installed the insulation should package the insulation upgrade with an attic cleanup service. If a homeowner bought this package, two guys would empty the attic and then help the owners sort through which stuff to give or throw away and which to put back in the attic. Meanwhile, another crew got busy putting in the insulation. Two versions of this deal were offered, one at the installer's cost, 190 pounds, and another at retail price, 271 pounds. This was on top of the cost of the insulation itself, which was 179 pounds. An experiment was conducted to test this idea, and the results suggest that it might be a winner. I say might because the data are so sparse that caution is necessary. In the interest of saving money, the only way the deal was made known to people was by mailing flyers to homes in three distinct but similar neighborhoods, picked because they were thought to have homes that were likely to be eligible for the deal. All the homeowners in a given neighborhood received the same letter, offering the discounted cleanup, the retail cleanup, or simply the standard green deal. This latter group was the control group. Nearly 24,000 flyers were distributed to each of the three neighborhoods. Unfortunately, the primary finding from this experiment is that very few people were willing to insulate their attics. Whether this was because they did not open their mail, did not find the deals attractive, or rather enjoyed a cold breeze wafting down from their ceilings, take-up was tiny. In total, only 28 attics had insulation installed. However, there is at least a strong hint in the data that the attic cleanup offer was a good idea. Although the sample sizes were all roughly equal, only three families accepted the straight insulation deal, whereas 16 did with the cheap cleanup condition and 9 did with the more expensive version. So nearly everyone who agreed to insulate their attics did it when they were offered some help in getting ready. However, the numbers are small enough that the experiment would need to be replicated to make one confident that the effect was real. For now, I think of this example as something between a scientific finding and a nifty anecdote. Much as members of the team would love to run a replication, the generally low take-up rates discouraged the department from repeating the experiment. So why include this example out of the many in the BIT portfolio? I have two reasons. First, I have never come across a better example of the Lewin principle of removing barriers. In this case, the removal is quite literal. Whether or not this specific implementation will ever be adopted on a large scale, remembering this example may provide someone with an inspiration for a powerful nudge in another situation. Second, the example illustrates potential pitfalls of randomized controlled trials in field settings. Such experiments are expensive, and lots of stuff can go wrong. When a lab experiment gets fouled up, which happens all too often in labs run by humans, a relatively small amount of money paid to subjects has been lost, but the experimenter can usually try again. Furthermore, smart experimenters run a cheap pilot first to detect any bugs in the setup. All of this is hard in large-scale field experiments, and to make matters worse, it is often not possible for the experimenters to be present, on site, at every step along the way. Of course, scientists skilled at running RCTs can reduce the risks of errors and screw-ups, but these risks will never disappear. Frustrations aside, we must continue to run trials and continue...